All right. Let us go back to then uh, Bias of our law. And I was debating whether to go through this derivation, but I think I'll do it just to just to do it, just to show it. And the derivation I'm talking about is we talked at the very end of class last time about a long straight wire. So this is a wire, and it has some conventional current running through it in that direction, call it capital I. And the wire is on the x-axis, so this is the y-axis. This is x. And we want to find the magnetic field at an observation location of 0, y, 0. And here's a little segment of wire that has a length delta L. And the position is x, 0, 0. And then this delta L vector, which is a vector pointing in the direction of the conventional current, we'll just call the length of that vector delta x, and then it's in the x direction, so it's delta x, 0, 0. Okay. So I'm just going to show an example of using this Biot-Savar law, which is the delta B is equal to mu naught over 4 pi I delta L cross R hat over R squared. We talked about what we're, what we're doing. We showed this as a computer program last time, how to do it numerically, where you're adding up the magnetic field due to each individual, each individual segment and then summing them up. Okay? So it's much like what we did with electric fields due to a charge distribution. You break it up into pieces and you add up the electric field due to each piece and then you use superposition to find the net electric field. Do the same thing here. So we start with a typical piece and we find the R vector from source to observation location for that piece. So that R vector is pointing from here to here. And R is going to be final minus initial, 0, y, 0, minus x, 0, 0. So r is going to be then negative x, y, 0. We need to find the magnitude of that. That's just going to be square root of x squared plus y squared. r hat is r over the magnitude, we have negative x, y, 0 over square root x squared plus y squared. And, and by the way, this derivation is in the book, so if you want to take notes, that's fine. But if you'd rather just sort of follow along, that's OK, too. Um, we need to do the cross product here. OK, so we found r hat and we found r. Now we want to think about this cross product delta L cross r hat. So we have delta K L cross r hat is going to be delta x 0, 0 cross with negative x y 0 divided by this magnitude. And already we know what's the direction going to be before we even work this out. The direction is going to be what? Out of the board, right? Right hand rule. Fingers in the direction of delta L. Curl them towards R hat. Thumb points out. So we know that we're just going to get a Z component and that delta B is pointing out. Okay. Uh, and there's a number of different ways you can calculate the cross product. But the sort of longhand form of doing a cross product, if you have... Uh, a cross B, and I'm not sure how many of you have seen this before, but you, you have A, if you want the X component, you have A, Y, B, Z minus A, Z, B, Y, comma. Uh, the Y component would be A, Z, B, X minus A, X, B, Z. And then the Z component is 
AXBY minus AYBX. How many people have seen that before? Okay, some of you have seen that before. You can get this from this from doing a determinant. Some of you may have seen a determinant method of doing a uh, cross product in a calculus class, but it works out to be that. All we care about is the z component because we know x and y are going to be zero. So the z component of this cross product, and I'll write it as delta L cross R hat z component. Well, let me bring this one over the magnitude out. It's just a uh, a factor that multiplies the whole thing. Okay, so that's that's still here, and I'm taking the cross product of x zero delta x zero zero with negative x y zero. So I have the x component of the first vector, so that's going to be delta x. I have the y component of the second vector, which is y minus the y component of the first vector, which is zero, and I'm done. Okay, so that's the z component of that cross product. So when I plug that back into here, and again, I'm just looking at the z component of delta b, I get mu naught over 4 pi. I have capital I. I have delta x. I have y. And I'm dividing that by, oh, well, first of all, I also have this thing square root of x squared plus y squared. And then I have another r squared factor here. So I have square root of x squared plus y squared squared. So that's just x squared plus y squared. And then I combine the denominator. I have i delta x y over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Once you've got this delta B, and notice it's in terms of, again, we're going to do a, in, an integral, so we're, we're going to sum up all these delta Bs, or take an integral of the dBs if we go to very small pieces. Then uh, what's our integration variable? What's, what are we summing over? What's changing as we move from one segment to another? x, right? x is changing. So we've got everything in terms of the integration variable and constant. So that's okay. And x is running from where to where? Well, x is running from, let's say, for a segment that has a, a length of L. x is going from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. And that gives We do this integral, integral from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2 of mu naught over 4 pi i y dx over x squared plus y squared. Mu naught over 4 pi i and y are all constant, so it just becomes an integral of dx over square, or excuse me, not square root, x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. When you do that integral, you will get the following. And you either look it up in a table or plug it into Mathematica or something like that. And you get the following result. The magnitude of the z component is going to be mu naught for 4 pi L, the length of the wire, times I over the y times the square root of y squared plus L over 2 squared, okay? And then because, okay, so that's a result for the magnetic field of a wire of length L on the perpendicular center, or uh, what do we want to call this, perpendicular bisector right a line going through the middle of the wire per and the distance uh, point perpendicular away uh, perpendicular distance away of y okay but we, again we usually call that distance r as usual so I just make a change in substitution so I'm going to call this r instead of the vector r now 
And so this becomes R, and this becomes R squared. Okay. So it's another result, but it's, it's coming from just applying this summation due to the BS of R law. And then I think at the, la in the very end of class last time we said if you have a case where the wire is very long and L is much, much bigger than R, and so what this boils down to B is this. You end up with, uh, let me erase this over here. You have mu naught over 4 pi. You have L times I, and then you have uh, R. So the square root of L over 2 squared, which just becomes L over 2. And then the L cancels out, and the 2 goes upstairs, and so we have mu naught over 4 pi. 2I over R is the magnetic field for a long straight wire. Okay, this is a case where L is much, much bigger than the distance away from the wire. Okay? So it's kind of a nice expression. Kind of again, it's an approximation, but it's a useful approximation, and we get this one over R distance dependence, similar to the one over R distance dependence for a long charge rod, for the electric electric field of a long charge rod. Questions here. This just you know, it's a derivation. Just going through the machinery of going of uh, getting this result. You can review it in the book, but I just wanted to show where this comes from as just an example. <laughs>